coming in. Um, I guess we'll get started. So welcome everybody to our second uh, iteration of the monthly series on active B stars. Um, today we're joined by Dr. Matt Schultz, a uh, postdoctoral researcher from the University of Delaware. Uh, Matt's background in astronomy began during his PhD at Queen's University in Canada, which included a two-year program at European Southern Observatory in Chile from 2013 to 2015. From 2016 to 2018, Matt completed a postdoc at Uppsala University in Sweden. And since that time, uh, Matt is now an Annie Jump Cannon Fellow at the University of Delaware, where he is currently uh, interested in researching magnetic hot stars, stellar magnetospheres, and binary systems. Today, Matt will be discussing uh, how rapid stellar rotation can strongly, or sorry, can shape the uh, distribution and flow of magnetic, magnetospheric plasma uh, in strongly magnetic B stars. All right, Matt, uh, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Keegan, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, without further ado, let's get started. So yeah, today we'll be talking about plasma transport in uh, hot star spheres with a particular focus on uh, the effects of rotation. Um, so this is work that I have done over the years in collaboration with a uh, quite a large number of people. I've highlighted um, the names of students who have made particularly uh, relevant contributions to this work, uh, especially in, in uh, the last couple of years. So, of course, to have a magnetosphere, you need a source of ions. And in the case of hot stars, that comes from the wind. Uh, they all have radiatively driven winds. These can go up to about 1% uh, of the speed of light and can drive quite a lot of mass loss from the surface of the star. As you see in the example here of this wolf ray star, whose wind is, you know, actually uh, visible. Um, so mass loss, of course, can generally have a pretty dramatic impact on the evolution of stars by reducing their mass over the course of the main sequence and the post main sequence. This affects the kind of supernova that you get and the kind of remnant, whether it's a black hole or a neutron star. Uh, it all, mass loss has a, an important impact on the interstellar medium as well. Uh, clearing out uh, wind-blown bubbles in star-forming regions, thus quenching star formation, triggering star formation sometimes at the edges uh, of the bubbles. Um, so it's overall understanding winds is pretty important to uh, the, uh, the study of the galaxy and of stellar evolution. Now, normally we kind of think of a stellar wind as being approximately spherical. Um, with maybe a bit of uh, substructure due to clumping, perhaps arising due to the line uh, de shadowing instability or uh, pulsations on the surface of the star or something like that. But you know, broadly speaking, the wind is effectively isotropic in all directions, at least for a single star. Now, winds of course are ionized. Uh, that means they're a plasma. And uh, when you put charged particles inside a magnetic field, uh, those, make th those particles will uh, be forced to follow the direction of the magnetic field. So then the question is, uh, do we actually see magnetic fields in hot stars with radiated winds? And the answer is, uh, we absolutely do. In about one in 10 cases, uh, for all O, B, and A type stars down to about 1.5 solar masses. Uh, we see magnetic fields uh, anywhere from a few hundred to tens of thousands of Gauss, um, which is sort of comparable in the upper range to what you would find in the middle of an MRI. Uh, the sort of uh, the average magnetic field strength is sort of on the order of a few, uh, several thousand Gauss. Now these magnetic fields, they're, they're stable over, um, at least over the time scale of decades or so. You see that illustrated here with this uh, longitudinal magnetic field curve. So this is showing the, the uh, average, the disk averaged uh, magnetic field strength. So averaged over the stellar disk uh, as a function of the rotation period of the star. 
and the different colors and symbols correspond to measurements uh, taken in different uh, different times, ranging from the 2010s all the way back to the 1980s. And there's essentially no difference uh, between the epochs. Any differences there are, are almost certainly instrumental. Um, their geometries are typically rather simple, uh, approximately dipolar. So what you're looking at here is a diagram that Oleg Kochikov made, uh, summarizing all of the results from uh, magnetic mapping using Zeeman Doppler imaging, which is the most rigorous means of determining the geometry of a stellar magnetic field. Uh, and the takeaway here is that the rounder the simple the, the symbol, uh, the more uh, dipolar the, uh, the magnetic field is. And you can see most of them are pretty round, um, with a few notable exceptions. And another interesting uh, thing is that there's no uh, support for convection in the outer envelopes of these stars, because um, they're radiative. There is no convection, therefore there's no support for a dynamo. And this is in contrast to what you would see in cool stars, of course, like the sun or ultra cool dwarfs, where you do have convection in the outermost regions, you have something to actually support a contemporaneous dynamo. So you have these very strong, very simple fields with uh, no known way of generating a dynamo. And uh, that leads us to suspect that they are magnetic fossils. They're left over from some previous time in the star's evolution. Um, and uh, we do know that from MHD simulations that these, uh, once they're established, these fields can be stable over evolutionary timescales. Exactly how we get them is still a subject for debate. So we know that about one in 10 stars uh, have a strong magnetic field. So what happens when you put a plasma inside? Well, whether anything important happens comes down to the relative strength of the magnetic field versus the wind. And we quantify this with something called the uh, magnetic wind confinement parameter, eta star, which is just the ratio of the uh, magnetic energy density to the kinetic energy density of the wind. So if eta star is greater than one, uh, specifically at the surface of the star, I should say, at the uh, magnetic equator. If that number eta star is greater than one, so the magnetic field is stronger than the wind at some point around the star, then uh, we consider the wind to be magnetically confined. And the larger greater eta star is, of course, the more magnetically confined the wind is. So in the simplest case, um, this is a, a, a star that's not rotating at all. And the magnetic field is aligned with the rotation axis. Uh, the flows from opposite com magnetic collatitudes are forced to follow the magnetic field. Uh, and then they collide at, in the magnetic equatorial plane. Uh, that takes away their momentum. They stall there. They collect. They build up. Uh, you get this, uh, this dense torus of plasma in the magnetic equatorial plane, which then gets pulled back to the surface of the star under the influence of gravity. Now that's something called a dynamical magnetosphere because the time scale over which the plasma persists inside the magnetosphere is the dynamical time scale. And these uh, can be detectable in H alpha uh, if you have a really high mass loss rate so that you're filling the magnetosphere uh, as fast as the material is falling out. And that's typically only the case for O type stars. So we really will only detect these in H alpha for, uh, for the small number of very hot magnetic stars. And we can also see uh, DMs in the ultraviolet because, of course, the UV is a row instead of a row squared diagnostic. Uh, so we can see this. Um, we can see DMs over a broader range of spectral types, uh, all the way down into the magnetic B type stars. So what you're seeing here on the left are a number of magnetic O stars. Uh, it's a silicon four line, um, and on the right, those are two examples of magnetic B type stars. Uh, looking at, I believe, the carbon four line. And the overall morphologies uh, are actually fairly similar. Uh, you get something that looks like a typical P-Signy profile at one phase and something that uh, is uh, showing quite a bit more emission uh, at other phases. You can also get X-ray emission from these stars. So the way this works is that uh, the magnetically confined uh, wind shocks uh, as it approaches the magnetic equatorial plane and that, uh, that shock produces, uh, produces x-rays. 
So when we actually look at how bright magnetic stars are in the X-rays, and you compare that to the predictions of the magnetically confined wind shock model, we find that um, there's actually a pretty good one-to-one -one correlation between the model predictions and the observations with, with a bit of scatter, which we'll come back to later on. Uh, you'll note that uh, the actual observed luminosity is about 10% of what would be predicted by the sort of basic XADM model. Uh, XADM is X-ray analytical dynamical magnetosphere. Um, and this is just due to the duty cycle of the uh, X-ray production inside the magnetosphere. So not only is the material forced to uh, follow the magnetic field and collide in the equatorial plane, it also is forced into co-rotation with the star. And in the case that the uh, the dipole axis is tilted from the rotational axis, which is kind of a general case, um, you will see some rotational modulation as the star rotates simply because you're seeing the magnetosphere from different angles. And this means, for instance, that the H alpha line strength changes over time, as does the morphology, and you might even get photometric modulation. So the photometric modulation is caused primarily by eclipsing. So as the uh, star is rotating at some phases, you'll be looking uh, with the, uh, the magnetosphere blocking the star, thus making it a little bit dimmer. And at other phases, it rotates out of the line of sight and is no longer blocking the star. And this can actually be used and has been used uh, to reconstruct the uh, size ge and geometry of magnetospheres in the Magellanic clouds that are too far away to uh, detect their magnetic fields using, using traditional spectral polarimetric measurements. This co-rotation out to several stellar radii uh, leads to extremely long moment arms. So if you think of these stars as uh, figure skaters, uh, as they extend their arms out, the rotation slows down just due to the conservation of angular momentum. And the larger the magnetosphere, the more rapidly the star will lose angular momentum, so the more rapidly it will spin down. So that's, that's theoretically that should happen. Observationally, do we see this? And the answer is yes, we do. Uh, so just over, if we compare uh, projected rotational velocities of magnetic in red and non-magnetic in black stars, uh, where we're using a projected rotational velocity because we typically don't have rotation periods for non-magnetic stars. Uh, we see that the magnetic stars are systematically more slowly rotating than their non-magnetic, uh, similar non-magnetic stars. Then if we look at rotation periods for magnetic stars, in this case, uh, magnetic B and magnetic A stars, uh, as a function of fractional main sequence age, we can see that the uh, rotation periods uh, systematically increase over time with the slowest rotators being systematically older than the, uh, than the uh, more rapid rotators. And this is actually in pretty good agreement with, uh, with evolutionary models. So you're looking at MESA models here that uh, self-consistently incorporate the effects of mass loss and angular momentum loss due to magnetic fields. Um, for a range of masses between five and 15 uh, solar masses. And there aren't really too many outliers uh, from the evolutionary tracks. This one over here is a binary and that's probably why it's an outlier. outlier. Um, so overall, the spin down seems to be fairly well reproduced. Now, you might've noticed from uh, a couple of slides ago that some of those rotation periods can really be exceptionally long. Uh, one of the longest rotation periods we found is around 30 years, actually another star with a rotation period of 50 years, that's an O star though. This is a magnetic B type star. And uh, recently, Christina Erba uh, has published the most recent paper examining this star, um, finding uh, for the first time uh, magnetic field measurements that are negative and uh, demonstrating that the ultraviolet lines uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope acquired uh, somewhat recently are quite distinct from the ultraviolet observations from IUE acquired at a different phase uh, about 30 years before. 
Now we can also sometimes directly measure spin down. Now to do that, we need a lot of measurements. We need like, you know, 20, 30 years of uh, typically photometric data with a, a pretty good cadence uh, throughout that time. Uh, and in at least one case, the actual measured rate of spin down uh, so just to back up for people who might not have seen a diagram like this before, this is an O minus C diagram, so observed minus calculated. Um, and in this case, it's looking, uh, well, it's comparing the time at which a certain photometric signature is expected, uh, given a constant rotation period to the time that it is actually observed. And then looking at that essentially as a function of time. So if this diagram gives you a straight line, then it tells you that you've just got the wrong period, dummy. But if it's anything but a straight line, then the period is actually changing. And in the case of this star, uh, the spin down rate that is measured is in excellent agreement with uh, the predictions of, uh, uh, well, theoretical predictions of magnetic breaking. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> in most cases, because we've done this for a few stars, um, we actually don't get anything like a uh, simple relationship. So just to back up again, if the angle of this parabola is up, up is bent upwards like that, that tells you it's spinning down. If it's bent downwards, it's spinning up. And if it's kind of going all over the place, that tells you it's spinning up and then spinning down and then spinning up again. Uh, and this is something that we're still scratching our heads over. So, as I mentioned before, some of the younger stars can be extremely rapid rotators. So we've got some stars that have 30 year rotation periods. We've also got stars that have rotation periods of uh, less than one day. So in that case, you've got a lot of uh, centrifugal force acting inside that co-rotating magnetosphere. And this leads to the formation of something called a centrifugal magnetosphere. So in this case, uh, you've got a, a part of the magnetosphere where the uh, centrifugal force is stronger than the gravitational force. So the point at which that happens of the balance between centrifugal and gravitational forces is called the Kepler co-rotation radius. Uh, the extent of magnetic confinement is called the Alfen radius. If the Alfen radius is greater than the Kepler radius, then you've got a region we call a centrifugal magnetosphere where the plasma is fed in by the wind, is trapped by the magnetic field under co-rotation, but then cannot fall back to the surface due to gravity due to the centrifugal support. So it builds up to much higher densities than you would get inside the dynamical magnetosphere. And that enables H alpha emission uh, to become detectable for stars that have much lower mass loss rates in the cases of stars uh, that we can detect the uh, dynamical magnetospheres in. So the one outlined in red here is the canonical uh, CM host star sigma or EE. And one thing I want you to notice is that the H alpha emission signature that you get from sigma or EE is quite distinct from the dynamical magnetosphere signature that you get from this magnetic O star. In particular, you've got these two, uh, these two bumps. So if you take all of the known magnetic OB stars and we put them on something called the rotation confinement diagram, uh, which just gives the Alfen radius, so the size of the magnetosphere, as a function of the Kepler radius, so faster rotation in this direction, uh, something interesting emerges. So uh, this line here, R equals RK, anything below this line uh, has a larger Kepler radius than the Alfen radius. So these are all stars with, dynam with only dynamical magnetospheres. And you see the luminosities of the stars that have H alpha emission are all quite high. Those are all O-type stars. And then in this intermediate region where you have some relatively small centrifugal magnetospheres, there are essentially no stars that have H alpha emission. The one, ex the one uh, exception to that is actually an O star itself. And then uh, finally, the stars that have very large centrifugal magnetospheres, so they have very large alpha and radii, but they're also rot rotating very rapidly. Uh, the majority of them also have H alpha emission. So you only get it, you get H alpha emission with an extreme centrifugal magnetosphere or if you have a really high mass loss rate. So, um, oh, looks like I, this is, uh, these, I, since the, uh, the reference here is missing, these models were calculated by Rich Townsend, uh, Townsend Milwaukee 2005 is the appropriate reference. Um, so 
uh, the plasma will build up in the magnetic uh, equatorial plane, uh, or really with the densest parts at the intersections of the uh, magnetic and rotational equators. So if you have a nearly aligned rotator as on the left, then the, uh, you get, you get a, a pretty um, constant plasma distribution. But if you have a highly tilted rotator like on the right, then you kind of get two more or less distinct clouds uh, with the densest parts of the magnetosphere at the intersections of the magnetic equatorial rotational planes uh, where the, uh, the plasma is being confined most strongly. And this leads to this kind of general warped disk morphology for CMs. Uh, also notice that there's absolutely no plasma beneath the Kepler radius uh, because below the Kepler radius, you have a dynamical magnetosphere and that material just falls back to the star. <clears throat> so if we take that rigidly rotating magnetosphere model and uh, we just rotate it and we, we can use this to predict what the uh, observables should look like. So in the top right, that's what the photometry should look like, just looking at the eclipses as the magnetosphere passes in front of the star. The bottom left is showing the uh, H alpha emission profile. And you see that when the two clouds are projected on either side of the star, you get the double, pump, double humped emission peak, which then um, the, the uh, emission bumps then move to lower velocities as the material goes in. I should back up and just mention that re, the, you have a, because of the co-rotation, there's a direct mapping between uh, the projected distance of the cloud from the star and its uh, line of sight velocity. So it's just quite distinct from a BE star, um, the classical BE star, because in that case you have Keplerian rotation. And in fact, uh, the way to distinguish the emission from a sigma or E variable like this and a classical BE star is that the strongest emission will occur at uh, typically about two times V sine I, whereas of course for a BE star, the emission is largely confined inside V sine I. So uh, the photometry from these stars is actually quite important historically because that the, this is how the magnetic uh, magnetospheres were first discovered uh, back in 1978. Um, so this, these eclipses uh, of sigma or E were originally believed to be due to uh, a, a very close interacting binary or something like that. And it was not until the magnetic field was discovered and it was found that there was an exact correlation between the magnetic variability and the photometric variability with moreover the eclipses occurring at magnetic nulls, where you're looking along the magnetic equatorial plane, that it was realized that this uh, photometric variation was caused by a magnetosphere. So you don't just have to use a tilted dipole model for uh, an RRM model. Uh, you can do that with any arbitrary uh, magnetic topology. So in this case, it's based on a Zeeman Doppler imaging map of sigma or E. And uh, the idea is to try and get an exact match between all of the observables for this star. So this is just showing that uh, that RRM model, arbitrary RRM model for uh, five different rotation phases. So if we use that to predict uh, the H alpha and the photometric variation, we get a pretty good match for the eclipses. And we get a pretty reasonable match for the expected H alpha variations. So these are dynamic spectra. This is rotational phase on the y axis, velocity on the x axis, and red indicates emission, blue indicates uh, relative absorption. You can see that you get eclipses here around phase one and phase point four, which you also see in the photometry. And uh, then about half a cycle later, after the eclipses, you get this strong emission at uh, large uh, projected distances. So we know how the plasma gets into a CM. It's fed in by the wind. We know that it's held by uh, magnetic field and by rotational support. But of course, you know, what goes in has to come out somehow. But how does that happen? So that question was first addressed back in the 1980s. Uh, and there were sort of um, two broad possibilities that can apply to these kinds of stars. 
you can either have uh, some kind of leakage mechanism where the plasma somehow is transported across magnetic field lines in kind of a steady state, or you can have uh, the plasma build up to such a density where uh, the magnetic field is no longer able to confine it, at which point it just gets grabbed by the uh, centrifugal force it's subjected to and ejected out from the star. That's kind of similar to uh, it's a magnetic reconnection process, somewhat similar to magnetotail reconnection that we get in planetary magnetospheres. So uh, Asif Adula back in 2008 did uh, some uh, 2D rotating MHD simulations uh, for, for aligned uh, rotators, um, since you can't do tilted dipoles in, in 2D. And uh, the breakout emerged kind of directly from these simulations. So the plasma would build up, and then at a certain point, the density uh, exceeds the ability of the magnetic field to hold it, and a parcel of plasma gets ejected away from the star to be a centrifugal force, and the magnetic field kind of rebounds a little bit. Um, and then uh, it, well, I guess not then, because the observation was in 2004, but um, X-ray flaring had been observed from the famous star signal or E. And uh, this seems like, okay, great. We've got X-ray flaring from this magnetic star. Uh, the simulations say that there should be breakout. So it's gotta be breakout, right? Well, maybe not. Because when we looked at Sigma Ori E using uh, a very high cadence, high precision space photometry, in this case with the most space telescope, uh, with about uh, three weeks of data covering uh, about 20 rotational cycles, uh, there was no indication of any cycle to cycle variability in the photometric signature. Uh, and you can look at another star, uh, HD36485 in this case. This is, this is a spectroscopic binary, so you have to sort of uh, correct for the radial velocity variability of the components to get a good look at what's actually happening in the emission. But this star has a pretty long uh, spectroscopic data set. Um, so these two observations are acquired at almost identical rotational phases, uh, but separated by about 20 years. And you can see that there's essentially no difference between the emission signatures uh, in these two observations. And there are some, maybe some minor differences there, but you know, instrumental artifacts, I would imagine. And then it turned out that Sigma or E uh, actually has a, a low mass companion, quite possibly a flare star, like an ultra cool dwarf or something, uh, in which case that x-ray flare was from the, the M dwarf and not from Sigma or E itself. So there went that positive uh, evidence for breakout. And this is, that, that led in turn to a re-examination of diffusion and drift models as, a, as viable leakage mechanisms, uh, which actually been rejected back in the 80s based on analytical arguments. Um, but uh, Waukee and Cranmer revisited this and uh, developed uh, a formalism for treating it um, as a thought experiment almost more than anything else. Uh, but So then looking again at the full population of stars that have H-alpha emission, so if, if leakage is uh, by diffusion or by drift is what's regulating mass transport in centrifugal magnetospheres, we'd sort of expect there to be some relationship between uh, the size of the magnetosphere given the, by the ratio of Ra to Rk, uh, the luminosity of the star, which as the luminosity goes up, we should have a, um, uh, a higher mass loss rate, of course. Uh, and what and the onset of emission. So the idea is that a stronger wind will fill the magnetosphere faster, competing more effectively with whatever the diffusion or drift mechanism is. Uh, and so that you should get the onset of emission at uh, relatively lower, um, uh, relatively smaller values of Ra over Rk. So the emission onset should sort of follow this dot dashed line instead of this, uh, this dashed line. And actually when this diagram is first made, the very, very weak emission in this star hadn't actually been found. So pretend he's not there. And you can almost convince yourself uh, that there's this diagonal relationship, especially if you ignore these stars, which at the time this diagram was first made, hadn't been looked at. 
So, okay, I mean, you got a maybe you got a diagonal relationship there, but then it turns out that, of course, the alpha n radius, which is determined from the wind magnetic confinement parameter eta star, which is determined partly from the mass loss rate, is then going to be itself a function of the mass loss rate. So when you correct this value for the mass loss rate uh, dependence, uh, you actually get a flat relationship. So this, this is really just an artifact of uh, that dependence. And then we looked at something different. We just looked at the at this uh, value BK. This is just the strength of the magnetic field at the Kepler radius. So it makes no reference to the mass loss rate at all. It's totally independent of it. And it turned out that uh, the onset seems to be a flat function of BK. Essentially, all of the stars with a BK higher than about 100 Gauss have a mission. Uh, a few, few stars below it, and maybe it's more like 70 Gauss or so that the actual emission onset is. And then as you go to a lower value, and then the emission just turns off like a switch. So this is really hard to explain in terms of uh, a leakage mechanism, but it's actually a direct prediction of centrifugal breakout. If you actually look at the strength of emission, that also correlates pretty nicely with uh, just with BK directly uh, without looking at anything else. So the correlation, the correlation parameter here is 0.74. So then uh, we looked at ASIF's MHD simulations from over a decade ago again, and this time uh, looked at the radial density profiles from them. And it turns out that they all follow the same power law drop-off uh, independent of what the actual value of eta star is. So we can take that radial uh, density from the CBO simulations and uh, just by fixing the density at the Kepler radius at a sort of an arbitrary value that gives us the optical depth, the de density scaling, uh, then tells us how far out we have uh, an optically thick uh, magnetosphere. So it tells us the area, the emitting area of the magnetosphere. And from that, we can predict, for instance, you know, what is the value of BK that you need to have an optical depth of unity? Uh, so this diagram here is showing the ratio of, of the actual BK value to that BK1 value, that sort of threshold value. And you can see that it's, it's, it's perfectly flat. Everything above, uh, above zero uh, BK equals BK1 is in emission. Again, forgetting about these low luminosity stars. And we can also use this, uh, this directly to predict what the emission strength should be. And again, we get actually a nice, uh, very nice correlation for the correlation parameter of 0.85. Even the shape of the profile can be predicted directly from this model, uh, which predicts that it should be sort of concave up uh, and then concave down uh, as you get out to uh, larger parts of the magnetosphere where you start to have, it becomes like optically translucent. Um, and in fact, when we take all of the emission wings of the stars that have H alpha emission, and we sort of combine them together and get like a mean emission profile, uh, we actually get something that looks a lot like that. So it seems pretty open and shut uh, that actually, yeah, it is breakout, which is regulating uh, plasma transport. But it's a bit different from what we thought. So rather than, uh, these breakout events just emptying the magnetosphere entirely and then it refills again, uh, it seems that they're hap they must be happening constantly because we need to reconcile all of the evidence for breakout with the fact that we don't see any cycle to cycle variability. And the only way to reconcile that is if the uh, azimuthal extent of the breakout events is fairly small and they're just kind of happening like popping off continuously. And there are some implications to this. So the first is that the rigidly rotating magnetosphere is not actually all that rigid because it is constantly at the breakout velocity or sorry, the breakout uh, density, which is the point at which uh, uh, the assumption, the fundamental assumption of the rigidly rotating magnetosphere model, which is that um, eta star is effectively infinite. So it's completely dominated by the magnetic field. It breaks down entirely. So 
You might have noticed when we were looking at sigma ori E's emission signature and comparing it to the RRM predictions that there was this feature here that was not reproduced. Uh, and it turns out that you can't reproduce this just by taking the RRM model and combining it with a photometric variation uh, that you would expect um, from chemical spots on the surface of the stars. That's something I kind of didn't mention earlier was that all of these magnetic B stars have uh, chemical abundance peculiarities that are sort of patchily distributed on the surface of the star and lead to this regular photometric modulation of their own. So you can sort of combine the two and uh, and you, you still don't get that emission bump. In fact, the agreement gets a bit worse. Um, but the density that is predicted by breakout is actually much higher than we were assuming before. Uh, and, uh, oh, sorry, that's actually not relevant to this slide. Um, so the uh, density that we predict by breakout is actually not relevant, is, is actually uh, higher than we were assuming before. And it's high enough that for a fairly a large CM, uh, we should actually have uh, Thomson scattering in the continuum, which can produce photometric emission at some of the rotation phases. Uh, and uh, now that we have access to test photometry for a large number of stars, we're starting to see these highly structured light curves in a lot of these stars with magnetospheres, which are hard to reproduce using purely photospheric spot models, uh, but and then seem, seem to be pointing towards circumstellar material. And actually, at least one case, there was a star where we saw this sort of shark-toothed uh, uh, cur uh, light curve and uh, thought, hmm, that looks like it, you know, if we're right about this being magnetospheric. And then we actually looked at the H-alpha for the first time, and sure enough, it's got a magnetosphere. So uh, over the last year or so, uh, Stan Owaki and I have been working closely with Ian Barry, uh, who has been developing um, models based on this idea of photometric emission from uh, centrifugal magnetospheres. Uh, as you can see an example of the model here on the left and the uh, predicted light curves uh, for uh, different rotation parameters and uh, different angular parameters on the right. And it's, it's showing quite a lot of promise. And uh, Ian has also been taking 3D MHD simulations that Asafadula has been doing for these stars and uh, comparing the two. So keep your eyes peeled for this work. It's quite interesting, in my opinion. What happens when this plasma flies away from the star then? Uh, in a breakout event. So, okay, does it just kind of like whoosh, fly off into the interstellar medium? Is that sort of is that? Sort of that? Well, back up a bit. So another phenomenon that we see in these stars is radio emission. Uh, so we have incoherent, uh, so it's not beamed, and we'll come to that in a second, uh, radio emission from uh, a lot of these type stars. And this emission is circularly polarized. Uh, it's got a fairly flat spectral index. Um, and the brightness temperature can be quite high, sort of like you know, 10 to the 10 Kelvin, 10 to the 8 Kelvin. Uh, so this is, it, it's clearly not photospheric. Uh, and uh, the conclusion that was reached um, many, many decades ago, back in the 80s, was that this has to be gyrosynchrotron emission. And you can see here that this radio emission is also rotationally modulated on the same period uh, as the uh, magnetic field curve. Sorry, for non-experts, Stokes I is intensity, Stokes V is circular polarization. So the idea that um, we've been working with for quite some time is that the origin of this gyrosynchrotron emission is in electrons that are accelerated up to relativistic velocities in this region called the middle magnetosphere. So this is outside of the Alphen radius uh, where the, the, the wind is now stronger than the magnetic field and it, the ram pressure stretches out the magnetic field, causes the uh, opposite polarities to sort of reconnect at the magnetic equatorial plane and leads to the formation of a current sheet. And inside that current sheet, the electrons are accelerated up to high velocities and then some of them travel back to the star spiraling along the negative field lines as they go and emitting gyrosynchrotron emission. And this model is actually fairly successful at reproducing uh, the 
uh, rotational variability of these stars, but it's not, it's not, it's a lot of free parameters in it. And you'll note that the power for this is coming from the wind, right? There is no connection to rotation in this model at all. And yet, when we put stars that have been observed in the radio on the rotation confinement diagram, all of the radio bright stars, all the stars that have been actually detected are all these stars with extreme CMs and in the same part of the diagram that we get H alpha emission from. This is telling us that rotation is playing some kind of a role. Uh, and then it's a natural to ask, well, maybe is it the current sheet or, you know, these breakout events are, this is magnetic reconnection. That could be enough to generate uh, the high energy electrons. So you might not need the current sheet at all. Uh, so to kind of look into this, uh, I took all of these stars, uh, did uh, one, two, and three variable, multi, uh, multivariable regressions uh, to just identify what the best combination of parameters was for reproducing the observed radial luminosity. And it turned out that the best model that we got empirically goes like B squared, R cubed, omega squared. So B squared, that's the, uh, that's the magnetic energy density. R cubed, that's a volume. So you know now we've got the magnetic energy. And omega squared, omega is the rotational frequency, right? So if it was just B squared, R cubed, omega, this would actually already be in the units of luminosity, but it's omega squared. Um, so I took that to Stan and he figured out that we could actually just use the rotation parameter to uh, get rid of one of those omegas. And he developed a scaling relationship uh, for the uh, centrifugal breakout luminosity that actually correlates pretty much perfectly with the observed radial luminosities. So this black line is just the x equals y line. The red line is the x equals y line shifted by a few orders of magnitude. Uh, and they match just beautifully. There's almost no difference between that and the regression line. Also note that all of the non-detected stars, the open blue squares, are all to the left of this. They all have uh, upper limits that um, uh, are higher than their pre uh, predicted ex uh, radial luminosities. Now, a lot of these stars also show coherent radio emission, meaning that it's beamed. You can see it's a sharp spike that appears at uh, over a very narrow range of rotational phase. And this is highly polarized, as you can see here in the Stokes V. So this is a rural radio emission uh, produced by the electron cyclotron mechanism by a small fraction of electrons get trapped in these auroral circuits and uh, get beamed out tangentially to those circuits, so which uh, are themselves around the magnetic poles. And that's why you only see them at certain rotation phases. So uh, for about, from the first discovery of that phenomenon, CU Veer in 2000 until 2018, there was one star, CU Veer, in which this was known. We're now up to about uh, seven stars in which this has been found. Um, and uh, it's very soon, it's going to be more like 15. Um, that paper is in preparation. So this is looking like it might be, in fact, almost a ubiquitous phenomenon. Now, uh, one interesting thing with uh, auroral radio emission is that it's not perfectly regular over time as every other diagnostic that we know of is for these stars. There are cycle to cycle variations in the pulse profile shape and even the strength. Uh, and one, I think, I think it's reasonable to ask if this could be related to breakout events, uh, which will be a bit stochastic and will be injecting plasma, you know, somewhat stochastically into uh, these auroral circuits. Looking at x-rays, you might have noticed uh, when I first showed this diagram that uh, some of the stars are actually more luminous than predicted by the XADM model. And these stars, so the color here is uh, oh, proportional to the uh, uh, size of the centrifugal magnetosphere. And most of these stars have pretty large centrifugal magnetospheres, which is probably an important clue. Uh, 
as to what is leading to the excess X-ray emission in these cases. So one idea uh, from rigid field hydrodynamic simulations, these are simulations where you, uh, it's, it's basically an RRM model, but you uh, let each magnetic field line basically be a pipe along which the gas can um, uh, be in hydrostatic equilibrium. And these RFHD simulations predict that you should get some hard X-ray caused uh, by like centrifugal acceleration at the edges of the magnetosphere. So that, that's, that's certainly one possibility. Uh, however, another possibility is that it might just come from breakout. So using a similar model to the one developed for radio, uh, Stan has shown that in fact, um, the, uh, the breakout luminosity is higher than the XATM luminosity for a, uh, pretty much all uh, values of eta star. Uh, running out of time pretty quickly, I just mentioned that in one case, it's uh, been suggested that uh, the X-ray variability might be consistent with X-ray aurora from particle precipitation in the royal caps. So that's kind of neat. Um, so if you put it all together, uh, you've got this pretty complex structure, right? You've got this, this free wind up here, this un unconfined wind. You've got this dynamical magnetosphere close to the star. You've got a centrifugal magnetosphere uh, with breakout events that are possibly generating uh, radio emission, uh, possibly influencing this auroral radio emission. And then you have X-ray emission, which is certainly coming from magnetically confined wind shocks, but which might also have uh, some contribution from the breakout events themselves. So why should you care? Uh, just very quickly, uh, there are a lot of similarities between uh, hot star magnetospheres and those of planets. Um, there's some similarities with pulsars too. It's actually not as similar as the case with planets. Planets, very similar. Uh, but with these hot stars, we can directly constrain the magnetic and rotational properties independently of the uh, magnetosphere properties, which you can't do for pulsars. And it's also very tricky to do for planets. Uh, we can look at these magnetospheres across the entire electromagnetic diagram, X-ray, UV, optical, didn't talk about it, but near infrared gives you very similar diagnosis to the optical. And of course, radio with both coherent and incoherent radio emission. There's a huge number of these stars that we can look at the magnetospheres in. So I think the single largest magnetosphere example is actually the radio sample, uh, which you're seeing here. But uh, in fact, and this is about 120 stars, 130 stars. Uh, but in fact, we barely dipped our toes in. Uh, so this is uh, sort of all of the known, all of the stars in which a magnetic field has been detected, uh, for which um, about a third, only for a third of them do we have rotation periods and a, a large majority we have like one magnetic measurement. So there's a lot of parameter space left to explore. Uh, it's also worth pointing out that the magnetospheres of these stars are much simpler than planetary magnetospheres. You have a, an isotropic ion source that is not sort of in motion relative to the magnetic field. Uh, so you don't have as many currents being generated um, and this leads to an overall simpler magnetosphere topology, which is much easy, a much nicer platform for investigating certain effects, such as plasma transport. We see similar structured light curves in ultra cool stars, which interestingly have uh, kilogauss scale poloidal fields, quite similar, in fact, to what we see for hot stars. Um, and uh, make, that this is magnetospheric in origin is one of the leading hypotheses to explain these highly structured light curves from these, uh, these rapidly rotating, strongly magnetized M dwarf stars. We also have auroral radio emission coming from ultra cool dwarfs, uh, which seems quite similar to what we have from the hot stars. And so why is this of interest to this group in particular? Well, it turns out that of all the various classes of magnetic early type stars, it is quite specifically the uh, magnetic B type stars, uh, the early magnetic B type stars that are kind of the ideal magnetospheric laboratories because we can study every single component in the magnetosphere because every single one of them is seen in every single available diagnostic. 
So these are actually some of the references from this paper. And uh, with that, uh, I will end with this uh, beautiful image from one of ASIF's 3D MHD simulations, which hopefully you'll be seeing very soon in the literature. And um, I am open to questions. Thanks, Matt, very much for that uh, informative talk. It was very nice. Um, before we jump into the questions, I just want to quickly remind everybody that uh, if you want to get an email reminder for these talks, um, feel free to just leave your email address in the chat and we could add you to our email list. Um, if anybody has a question as well, just um, write in the, in the chat that you, um, you would like to ask a question and I can uh, field those uh, in the order that they come up. Um, but perhaps to start us off, I'll ask a question that I have since we don't have any in the chat just yet. So Matt, I was wondering, um, you had mentioned that the surfaces of these stars have um, perhaps chemically or regions of chemically different um, uh, makeup. And I was wondering if perhaps these stars show uh, star spots as well from the magnetic fields. Uh, and, and perhaps if yeah. the, um, the activity of those star spots could lead to um, perhaps photometric modulation that you would see in, in some of your observations. So that's a great question. Um, so the answer is in terms of the kind, so when you say star spot, I suspect you mean something similar to sunspots. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and the answer is no, we see no evidence for that particular kind of star spot. Uh, it's important to remember that the magnetic fields of these stars are not really changing over time, right? Um, so they're not, it's not like the, the suns, which is all twisted up and you've got these regions of magnetic flux, which are rising uh, and then, you know, like leading to the formation of, of sunspots. Um, so the, chemically, the, the chemical patches that we get actually come uh, are a consequence of the stability of the photosphere induced by the magnetic field combined with radiative levitation of different chemical elements along, which, which sort of leads to them to accumulate in certain parts of the star and, and not accumulate so much in other parts of the star. Uh, however, uh, there is an increasingly solid theoretical uh, background for the formation of uh, star spots in um, stars in which we haven't detected large scale fields, which might still have small scale fields. And there is in fact some support for that observationally as well from space photometry. That's oh. more for more for O stars, but there's no reason to suspect you wouldn't have it for B stars as well. Interesting, okay. So we haven't had any other questions pop up in the chat just yet. Um, again, if anybody want, oh, we do have one actually from Anusha uh, Ravi Kumar. Anusha, if you want to, uh, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Keegan. Yeah, that would be great. Can you hear me? Yes. Keegan, or, or Matt, maybe you could, unless somebody wants to see a figure, why don't you stop sharing yeah, sure. the screen and everybody can kind of see each other? Perfect. That's wonderful. So, okay, I was meaning to ask you, uh, do we have any specific time scales under which these magnetic uh, field events vary? And uh, does it vary in between O and B stars as well? Sorry, um, do we have specific time scales on which, uh, what varies? The, the magnetic field strength or the nature of the magnetic field around these stars um, so, uh, yeah, I didn't go into this, but, uh, we expect that, um, the magnetic flux should actually be conserved in the star. Uh, and then of course, since as the star evolves, the radius increases and that will drag the magnetic field lines out with it. And that leads to a, a weakening of the magnetic field over evolutionary timescales. Um, and we do actually see... Uh, excellent evidence of that. Uh, and there is some, some evidence uh, that the flux itself might decay over time for more massive stars. Although that's, that's harder to discern. Okay, yeah, thank you. 
So do we have any changes between um, uh, O and B stars as well? So you're saying that we don't as such have any clue about No, actually we do. Like, so insofar as flux decay has been found, oh, um, okay. it seems to be mass dependent. So it seems to decay the most rapidly for the more massive stars. Right. So um, investigations uh, that, for instance, Oleg has done for AP stars find like that the flux is constant with uh, with time, and this has been confirmed uh, in a couple of studies since. When you look at uh, B type stars, you do see start to see flux decay, and uh, it's also been suggested that that should be even more accelerated for O type stars. For O type stars, yeah, it depends. On yeah. The Thank you. Okay, um, if there's any more questions, again, just feel free to uh, let us know in the chat. Um, Dietrich has his hand up. Oh, Dietrich, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, a beautiful talk, uh, Matt, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, you have not mentioned uh, binaries. Uh, would you no. expect companion stars to, to affect the picture and disturb it? Oh, absolutely. Um, so, uh, there are a relatively, like very, actually very few magnetic stars that are in binaries, um, which is, it's thought to relate to their formation mechanism in some fashion, but, uh, there are a two or three examples of magnetic stars, um, in binary systems in which we have, uh, magnetospheric diagnostics. And in one of those cases, for sure, the H alpha emitting centrifugal magnetosphere is strongly modified because it's a very tight binary, but a 1.5 day period, it's tidally locked. Uh, and in that case, you can see a clear influence uh, in the H alpha emitting region from the, the uh, Lagrange geometry. Um, and there's some in indication in a couple of other systems that are not tidally locked that you might have some kind of interaction. Uh, although that's less, less certain because the results are still very preliminary. Thank you. Okay. Oh, uh, Stan, please go ahead. Yeah, first of all, I want to thank uh, Matt for just a, an absolutely wonderful presentation of so many things. I could never have achieved such a broad overview of both the observations and the theory. It's really quite remarkable. And Matt had, and I have been working very closely on these various issues, especially related to symmetry breakout. And in, in, in case you couldn't tell from the talk, <laughs> tell from the talk, I'm not claiming, I'm not complaining about that. But I, I, uh, I, I wanted to point out the he and also he did a masterful job of connecting to this idea of ma uh, planetary magnetospheres. And I, I wanted to just mention one interesting thing because he mentioned how planetary magnetospheres are being stressed from the solar wind and have this very complicated geometry. Uh, with all these currents mm -hmm. or, and everything. But, but in the case of Jupiter, there's kind of a, a, an analogous thing going on, which is the, the feeding of the magnetosphere from the uh, outpouring of sulfur ions from the satellite EO. And then this, this leads to this so-called EO torus, which in some respects behaves a lot like um, a lot like the feeding of a, a internal feeding of a stellar wind of a magnetosphere. And so one of the things we're looking at right now is to the extent that some of the things that are going on with the magnetosphere of Jupiter, including, for example, the radio emission, might be linked to the Eotaurus and to this feeding. And, and as a part of that, Matt mentioned this beautiful relationship that he found uh, that, you know, that I ended up in identifying with the centrifugal breakout model. Uh, when it, it gives you the radio emission as a function of uh, of uh, it, uh, the breakout parameters, and if you extrapolate that down to the scale of the magnetic field of Jupiter, it matches pretty well the radio emission from Jupiter. So that's a kind of a very not interesting not perfectly. I want to emphasize it's but, but, but there's, it's, it's, there's it's, at least it's enough not, here. It's not bad. It's not it's, bad. For it's at least a relationship over 
such huge uh, uh, differences in scale. It's uh, yeah. and and yeah. so it's at least something that'd be interesting to explore. And I think this is one of the beautiful things. Matt made this comment that I think B star magnetospheres are really a great laboratory for magnetospheres in general, including planetary magnetospheres, but also you know things like pulsars and stuff. Now the other thing I want to mention is he mentioned this beautiful this other link between the non the the non uh, the gyrosynchrotron radiation and then these beamed radiation. Well, the beaming comes from when electrons are very very relativistic, and then you only can see them the radios when you're looking at just the right angles, so they can be very delicate, it's a very delicate kind of thing. But they're both probably coming from the same population of, you know, at least the same process. Uh, maybe the lower energy electrons are giving you the, the continuous gyrosynchrotron. Now, I, I have gone all my career, I'm not known very much about radio, but now we're just in the process of jumping in and trying to understand radio emission. And I think it's an area in general that we astronomers have tended to ignore, and uh, and I, you know, I take uh, blame for that myself. But uh, I, it's a great diagnostic. You have all these ground-based observations of radio emission, and so that that I think is a, a great uh, possibility that, that that there's a unified model between the radio emission, the, the rotational modulated gyrosynchrotron radio, and this beam radiation, and probably they're reflecting different parts of the energy spectrum of electrons. That may be both uh, accelerated by the centrifugal breakout reconnection. Oh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's uh, that's what my comment is and great talk, Matt. Thank you. Um, yeah, Suman has a uh, Suman. Go go ahead. Oh, you know, Mike's not working probably. Sorry, it's very good part. Uh, what is the relationship between the limb darkening and an observational point of view? Um, Well, uh, you have to take it into account when you're turning your magnetic measurements into a uh, model of the photospheric magnetic field, for instance. Um, I would imagine it's also something that should be taken into account for calculations of uh, photometric eclipses and such. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, I'm not sure if that answers the question you had, though, so really feel free to uh, add more. All right. So I think um, perhaps seeing as it's uh, four or five past the hour now, um, we'll, uh, oh, Suman says thank you. Uh, so perhaps we'll wrap things up. I just want to say thanks again, Matt, one more time for, uh, again, this wonderful presentation. Um, thanks, Matt. It was a great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And again, if uh, we're going to be, these are going to be monthly or perhaps uh, bi-weekly, depends on the schedule, um, uh, talks for the series. So if you want to leave your email in the chat as a reminder for when these talks are, uh, feel free to do so. Um, okay, that's it, everyone. Uh, thanks again for coming and have a wonderful day. Have a good day, everyone. Bye, thank Bye you. Now. Bye guys, thank you.